In this video, we are going to look into carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. Carbon-13 is an isotope of carbon that has natural abundance of 1.1%. The most abundant isotope of carbon, carbon-12, is not magnetically active, and we cannot study it by NMR spectroscopy. So, we are studying by NMR spectroscopy only 1% of carbon atoms. Carbon-13 isotope has a spin of one half, which is rather convenient because it gives first order spectra, those that are relatively easy to interpret. A scale for carbon-13 nuclei, NMR scale, covers the range between 0 and 220 ppm, so a much larger scale compared to proton NMR. And when we consider chemical shifts of typical carbons, uh, they are uh, 15 to about 30 ppm for methyl carbons, for CH3 group. Methylene carbons absorb in the region of between 20 and 65 ppm. Electronegative atoms that are attached to carbon shift absorption of such carbon to the region of between 40 and 80 ppm. Alkyne carbons absorb between 70 and 90 ppm, that's triple bond sp hybridized carbons. Alkenes are in the region of between 100 and 150 ppm. Aromatic carbons have absorption between 120 and 170 ppm. Carboxylic acids and derivatives absorb in the region of between 155 and 185 ppm. And finally, carbonyl carbons absorb in the region of between 180 and 220 ppm. Here is carbon-13 NMR spectrum of ethanol. And as you can see, there are two carbons in ethanol and two signals in carbon-13 NMR spectrum as expected. And here is information we can obtain from carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Number of signals gives us a number of different carbon nuclei that are present in a molecule. Chemical shift gives details of their chemical environment. And Splitting of signals, which may, may occasionally observe that depends on the conditions under which spectrum is taken, and we'll spend a lot of this video discussing that. A splitting of signals may tell us how many protons are present on each carbon nucleus. One very important difference between proton and carbon-13 NMR spectra is that carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy is not a quantitative method, so there is no integration of the signals area under the peak of the signal does not correspond to the number of carbon atoms. We cannot use it in that uh, form. We cannot use it to determine a number of particular type of carbon atoms that give rise to each signal. Typically, carbon-13 NMR spectrum is recorded as a proton decoupled spectrum. That's also called broadband decoupled spectrum. That's because in the course of acquisition of carbon-13 NMR spectrum, protons are irradiated with broad range of frequencies, broad band of frequencies, at which protons absorb. So protons end up flipping between two spin states rapidly, and only average state is experienced by carbon, so there is no coupling. And so each carbon signal appears as a singlet. There is no coupling to protons. So that gives us sharp singlet for each carbon and no couplings. So here is an example of broadband decoupled spectrum of a molecule that contains four different carbon atoms. But it is possible to also record an off-resonance decoupled spectrum. That's rather somewhat complex technique, but that technique allows carbon-hydrogen coupling to be preserved. So hydrogens that are attached to carbon atom split the signal. And we can see number of hydrogens attached to each carbon atom. So this is an example of methyl vinyl ketone. And signal A is due to methyl group. There are three hydrogens on that carbon, so signals is split into quartet. And this is how we usually do it. We uh, print off resonance decoupled spectrum above the broadband decoupled, so that above each signal we can, we can see the splitting pattern. So we can see that signal A is split into quartet, which means that that's CH3 group. Signal B at the far end is carbonyl carbon, it is not split, 
also note its low intensity. It's not split, it, it means it has no protons attached to it. Signal C is CH uh, carbon, and it's split into a doublet. So a doublet, only one proton is splitting it into a doublet. And finally, signal D is CH2 group, so that is split into triplet. So splitting of a signal in carbon-13 NMR is due to hydrogens directly attached to that carbon atom, and same pattern is followed as before. Multiplicity of a signal is n plus 1, where n is number of hydrogens attached to carbon. Frequently, we don't plot the two spectra one on top of the other. Instead, we simply uh, print or plot broadband decoupled spectrum and then indicate multiplicity next to the signal, above each signal. So, signal for methyl group, multiplicity is indicated as Q for quartet, signal for next signal a symbol D, which would be a CH2 group, is indicated as triplet, a symbol, a signal C is indicated as doublet, and finally carbonyl carbon at around 200 is indicated as a singlet. Recording of proton decoupled and off resonance decoupled carbon-13 NMR spectra to determine number of protons attached to each carbon is sometimes useful but it does have some serious limitations. In fact, in most of the complex molecules, it's pretty useless, and that's because of the overlap of the signals. In this example that we have here, and that's ethyl propyl benzene, para ethyl propyl benzene, signals overlap. If you look at two signals to the right of methyl groups and also some of the aromatic signals, they overlap, and, in, and this is idealized spectrum. In the actual spectrum, it will be very difficult to figure out multiplicity of the signals. So for that reason, we have developed a much better, much more accurate technique that has much fewer problems. And that's called depth technique. It stands for distortionless enhancement by polarization transfer. And depth technique is used to determine accurately number of protons attached to each carbon. Depth technique relies on recording three carbon-13 NMR spectra, and from signals that appear in those three, drawing conclusions about number of protons attached to each carbon. So we record normal carbon-13 NMR spectrum, that's usual carbon-13, then depth-90 and depth-135 carbon-13 NMR spectra. Depth-90 and depth-135 stands for special techniques, where we apply additional RF pulse in case of depth 90, that RF pulse flips vector of magnetization of carbon-13 nucleus by 90 degrees, and 135 flips vector of magnetization of carbon-13 nucleus by 135 degrees. You don't, and th then those techniques result in a special type of spectra, where signals have special appearance, which you will see in a minute. You don't need to understand this or to know details of the technique, all you need to know is how to apply the results, how to apply the outcome. And that means simply you need to be able to interpret these three spectra. So when we record these three spectra, carbon atoms, those without any hydrogens that are attached to them, appear only in the normal carbon-13 spectrum and they give no signals in depth 90 and depth 135. CH carbons, those that have only one hydrogen, appear in all three spectra and give positive signals in all three spectra. CH2 carbons, methylene carbons, appear in the normal spectrum and in depth 135 as a negative signal. They do not give any signal in depth 90 spectrum. And finally, CH3 carbons, methyl carbons, appear in the normal and depth 135 as positive signals and give no signal in depth 90 spectrum. So that's summarized here in these two tables. In one table it's listed which signals are positive, no signals are negative, and in the other what signals actually look like. Here is an example of a depth experiment. And we will use the same compound as before, paraethylpropyl benzene. So you can see now the depth experiment can easily uh, determine number of attached protons on each carbon in this compound. First, we record regular carbon-13 NMR spectrum, and that gives us one signal for each 
different types of carbons. So that tells us how many different types of carbons there are. Next, we record depth 90. And depth 90 tells us which carbons have only one hydrogen attached to it, because only CH carbons show in depth 90. And so we can see that E and F, two carbons, are CH carbons. And of course, rest, car rest of the carbons are simply not CH. They are either carbon without hydrogens, CH2 or CH3. And to distinguish between remaining three, we record depth 135. In depth 135, we can still see H as positive, but also now CH3 appear as positive. And so A and I can be assigned as CH3 carbons because they appear in depth 135, but not in depth 90. And then we can see three negative signals. And th those are B, H, and C. And we can draw conclusion that those are CH2 groups because only CH2 appear as negative in depth 135. Finally, we can draw conclusion that D and G are quaternary carbons or carbons without any hydrogens attached to them because they only appear in the normal carbon 13, but they do not appear in depth 90 and do not appear in depth 135. As you have seen, uh, printing of the three spectra of that experiment takes a lot of space. So frequently, we actually don't print all three spectra and don't have a viewer interpret those three spectra. You may have to do it on the exam, but in practice, we frequently print only normal carbon-13 NMR spectrum and then print results, interpretation of that spect depth spectrum on the carbon-13 uh, regular spectrum. So next to each signal, we print what kind of carbon it is, as shown here, like CH3 for first two carbons, then next from going from right to left, then next three are CH2 groups and so on, and aromatic carbons are either carbons without hydrogens or CH carbons. So this is more common way to represent results of a depth experiment. This completes our study of carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. Next, we're going to look into symmetry and NMR spectroscopy.